When I was 12 to 13, my goal was to represent Australia at the Paralympics. We had the Canadian Paralympic team come and train at our pool, seeing all these people with missing limbs, and that was pretty cool, and I think that's what started that little fire in my head. So I have a rare form of dwarfism called diastrophic dysplasia. Apparently it's a one in a million chance of it happening. So there goes my parents' chance of winning the lottery out the window, gone. Swimming was recommended by doctors when I was little. Obviously, it was good fitness for me. It's uh, prolonged a lot of surgeries that people like myself would have. Um, so I really didn't like swimming back when I was younger. I wanted to play cricket or football because that's what all boys want to do. But as I got older, I was competitive, realising you know, when I was 11 or 12, I couldn't really play cricket or, or AFL with the boys my age because I'm this tall and they're that tall. Um, we go swimming go. In 2000 to 2002 I swam and then I stopped from 2002 to 2007 and I put on about 20 kilos. I was about 65 kilos. I looked like Jabba the Hutt. After high school I decided that being fat wasn't the right thing and I wasn't finding any girls being fat. Uh, and then I got back into competitive swimming and followed that dream that I had when I was a little boy of one day representing my country at the Paralympics, which happened in 2012. This moment means a lot, you know, representing our country. Um, it's, this is my first game, so it's a big eye-opener for me. I've been on multiple world champ and Parapan Pac teams now, but I still haven't won that Paralympic medal, so I'm still chasing that. So my goal at the moment is to go to Tokyo next year and have a red-hot crack at trying to win that elusive Paralympic medal. I train nine times a week, seven water sessions in a pool of Herbie and two gym sessions with Karina. So mornings when I'm swimming, I'm up at 4.45 and then we're in the water at 5.30. In the pool I average two to three k's. So, you know, on top of my 40 hour a week full-time job, I've then got about 20 hours training for my sport as well. So by the time I get to the weekend, I'm ready for bed. Yeah, I met Scooter when he was about 11 or 12. Um, he was only a young fella back then at the, the Taz Aquatic Centre. We've got Scooter onto eight Australian swim teams now over the 11 years that we've been working and doing it seriously. And he trains harder than anyone else. You, I put a program up on the board and he'll make sure that he has to get it done. As far as an athlete goes, yeah, you, you wouldn't want anyone bar Scooter because he's just so full on. He wants to do really well and he's just got that drive and passion to succeed. I remember when I first started swimming, the doctor said, if you want to live a good life, you probably should back it down to two sessions a week. And if I want to do something with swimming, well, I can't sit there and do two sessions a week. I have to train a lot. So yeah, I chose the, the risky option and I'm still gone. I'm falling apart slowly, my hips are out to play up and my shoulders are actually good now. I think it's because I just swam through it and they're like, oh, he's not going to give up stuff. It. Let's just keep going. <laughs> Uh, people with his disability have had rods in their backs and they are in wheelchairs. He's just amazing because of the swimming he's done and the, and the strength we've built up over time. There's nothing he can't do really, um, apart from you know get the strawberry jam off the top shelf of the supermarket. But, that, but that's just part of what he does. I find a way around things so I can fit in with society, which is difficult sometimes. But if you ask any of my friends, they say I don't even know he's got a disability. So. I just sort of get on with day-to-day -day life, life as normal. For me, when I was growing up, it was fitting in, being able to do what everyone else does. And when I was growing up, the whole time I was thinking, I want to have a car, I want to get a house, you know, maybe have a bird one day, I'm not so worried about it anymore. And my parents did a good job of bringing me up when I was little. They didn't wrap me in bubble wrap, and they've made me to be the independent man I am today. So, no, I'm happy as Larry. He does take the, the piss out of himself a fair bit as well, you know, he calls himself a midget, um, which he is, um, and it's not disrespectful because, you know, I'll call him a midget as well, I'll call him short or, you know, we train short course in here, we think that's funny, you know. 
There's a lot of short people out there, but hate the word midget. And yeah, I can see where they're coming from, but to be honest, we're on this world for a short time, and if you're going to get offended by someone saying midget or dwarf or whatever they say, well then you're constantly going to be angry for the rest of your life. Everyone has a joke, and you get on this roller coaster, you just keep rolling. And then I'm happy and not upset, because why do you want to be upset your whole life? You know, the whole club and the whole team here are proud of him. He's done, he's done an amazing job to still be swimming and to have him in the program. And the other kids look up to him, even though they can't look up to him because he's smaller than all of them. But they do look up to him as a role model. And he's just one of the team here, one of the gangs. So it's quite fun. If I win a medal at Worlds or something like that, that's going to be, wow, adrenaline coming through my blood. If I go to the Tokyo and get a medal, I'm going to cry. Because <sighs> that would have been 12 years of dedication and that is better than any drug you can purchase. Me doing this over the last 12 years has given me something to push towards and my commitment and what I show here at the pool, it runs off in life. So anything I do at home, I make sure I, you know, I give it 158% and do my best at it. And that way, well to me, you live a long and prosperous life.